Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I must say it's about five years since I last addressed a Investing in Fuel Cells conference. Uh, so I compliment Cleantech and Nomura for their foresight. And if invited back next year, happy to account for my very bullish outlook on this sector still. Six years ago, when I joined Hydrogenics as CEO, I had the opportunity to run two solar companies. And my friends, what have you done? Why would you join a hydrogen company instead of a solar company? Today, I look back and I think I made the right choice. There's a power shift happening in the world, moving from uh, fossil fuel-based technologies to clean energy technologies with storage as a critical component. The volatility that we have in our price markets for energy is something that we need to address, and more localized supply and production of renewable generation and zero emission clean technology will be the way of the future. All of this has been accelerated in a major way after the unfortunate events in Japan leading to uh, clear plans now to move away for, from nuclear energy and more decidedly toward renewable generation. Hydrogen, uh, hydrogenics is involved in the deployment of technologies to support this shift in several important areas and I'd like to share with that, that with you this, this morning. There are three business lines where we are focused. The first is in the generation of uh, hydrogen through electrolysis, uh, through on-site generation. We are the global market leader in this area. We outsell our closest competitor two to one, and we've deployed many, many sites around the world, more than 2,000 products over a 60-year history, uh, if you can combine all of our, the acquisitions that we have made. In hydrogen fueling, we've deployed 40 hydrogen fueling stations around the world and see significant acceleration with recent deployments in Oslo, Istanbul, Turkey, in Belgium, and the largest fueling station in Europe in Hamburg, which is interestingly owned by Vattenfall, a utility. In the area of power systems based on hydrogen, we deploy backup power units with a major uh, American uh, partner, which is a leader in the area of cellular communication backup systems. And for mobility operations, we're doing uh, systems on bus platforms and truck platforms around the world. The most important area that I think is the future of hydrogen technology for many important reasons is the area of energy storage. And I'm going to take some time to explain uh, both the reasons for that and the business case in just a few moments. This emerging market is now clearly showing itself. Uh, I think from an investment point of view, there is always the hype period that any industry goes through. We've recently seen that happen with batteries and solar. And then into a, a dark period, crossing the chasm it is called. For us, it has been the last 10 years. And now we are seeing very clear signs of an emergence, which I think is worthy of paying attention. There have been 18 hydrogen storage projects. You just saw this on another slide. 18 hydrogen storage projects announced in, in Germany just in the last year and a half. Six of those projects have been settled, and four of those six went to Hydrogenics as a supplier. We're clearly leading in this particular application. The automotive fuel cell story is also showing itself. Just yesterday, Toyota made public announcements where they're saying they're not so confident about the future of pure battery EVs, and they believe the future of electric mobility, and this is not a new statement, uh, they believe the future of electric mobility is based on the hydrogen fuel cell platform. I was head of manufacturing for Toyota for seven years in Canada. I know the uh, chief engineer of the Prius and the plans that have been in place for a long time within Toyota, which is strongly focused on this method of zero emission transport. Fuel infrastructure, of course, will follow this trend uh, with more than 40 uh, stations that we've deployed around the world in recent years. We're seeing significant acceleration. There is no chicken and egg situation here. A hydrogen fueling station costs around two to three, three million dollars to deploy from a hydrogen technology point of view, which is not much different than a typical diesel or petrol station. We're seeing volume quotations for our fuel cell solutions now in the thousands. This is a very transformative moment for us because this is well in excess of 10 million uh, US dollars in revenue in single orders. So we've moved through the demonstration periods of the ones and twos and threes and the tens, the hundreds, and now we're looking at deployments in the thousands, which is a significant revenue transformation for the industry. As well, there are significant development technology areas for us that are now going live and will result in substantial revenue growth. This is an industry that's been hard to make money in, and when you try to focus on a single uh, application or product platform, you'll suffer a lot. Uh, it's been my strategy within Hydrogenics over the last six years to hold several strong cards, and I'm now seeing many of them come to fruition. 
The strong differentiators for us is first of all in the energy storage area. We're clearly the market leader, as I said, Four of the six projects that have been settled in Germany have all gone to Hydrogenics. We're the first to market with many other deployments at smaller scales, but now we're deploying multi-megawatt projects with industry leaders in the utility sector, such as E.ON and Enbridge. E.ON, the largest utility in the world, uh, we will de deploy a two megawatt hydrogen energy storage system in December of this year after just receiving the order in May. It was a 14-month process of due diligence and a competition to win that project, so we didn't win it easily, uh, but uh, we ran the gauntlet and did very well in securing that project for deployment in December of this year. Enbridge is the largest natural gas distributor in North America, and they invested in the company and are working jointly with us to commercialize the power to gas application in North America. In power systems, we have a world uh, leading capability in integration of fuel cell systems. We have a number of important patents which distinguish our systems from the standpoint of performance and dur durability. And we've been tested and developed as a company by a number of very challenging partners, very large companies to work with uh, to develop power systems based on hydrogen. Again, in hydrogen generation, we are the global market leader, and we partner with a number of the industrial gas companies to deliver industrial gas hydrogen solutions around the world in more than 100 countries. Our product platform is simple from the standpoint there are three uh, separate product platform technologies that we work with in hydrogen generation, in energy storage, and power systems. I'd just like to highlight in the center of this slide what we're delivering today at one to two megawatts to companies like E.ON are essentially starter kits. It's necessary to satisfy the needs for energy storage to deliver something in the range of 10 to 50 megawatts in a single project to, to meet the needs of the fluctuating electrical power grid. So we're seeing just the beginning of this market, but substantial revenue promise for us as we go to larger scale projects. The power to gas application is one that is new for I'm sure many of you and I'd like just to take a, f a few moments to explain how we take electrical renewable generation from wind and solar and convert it into a gaseous form which can be stored. The most important business aspect of this particular model is we are introducing banking into the energy industry. When you, we make electrons in the electrical system, they have to go somewhere immediately, just from a physics point of view, and having storage in this industry is a very critical resource. Today, we run our electrical systems almost like a town without a water tower. We make it and use it immediately, and storage resources are critically required now to complement renewable generation. This solution uses the existing natural gas infrastructure as the pipeline and storage container for renewable generation. So we take surplus electrical energy, pass it through an electrolyzer which converts electrons into hydrogen gas, and then use the natural gas system as a means of storing and transporting that energy. The energy then can then be recovered as a fuel through the natural gas system uh, for heating or power generation or the regeneration of electrical energy. It introduces the possibility of upwards of many months of energy storage. And one of the attractive points for Enbridge, which in Canada stores more than six months of heating fuel every cycle, it means that we can mop up or soak up surplus renewable generation in the spring and bring it out in the hot August months when the air conditioners are running and recover that energy over a long storage period. There's another important difference with hydrogen, and this has been well recognized in Germany, where a number of storage solutions have already been tried. On this chart, you see on the backdrop with the fluctuating line, the output of the uh, wind generation for E.ON in the northern part of Germany, fluctuating in just a matter of hours between zero and eight uh, gigawatts of output. This problem uh, continues to worsen in Germany and is the reason why there's a great deal of focus on the need for energy storage. On the right-hand side of the slide is a compressed air storage plant, which actually exists in Germany and is operated today. Uh, the amount of store, uh, energy that that compressed air storage plant stores is the area under the curve, the larger graph on the left-hand side of the slide, in the small red box. The conclusion of E.ON is, is that simply they will never build enough compressed air storage plants to come anywhere close to meeting the needs of the problem. There is also pumped hydro facilities in Germany. This is the lake on the mountain trick where you pump water up the hill at night and, and then recover the energy back through a turbine during the day when it's required. 
In the small blue box on the bottom left-hand side of the screen is the amount of an actual pumped hydro facility that's operating in Germany today. The same problem of scale exists. If I take the volume of the compressed air storage plant on the right-hand side, and instead of compressing air into the ground, I compress the same volume of hydrogen, I end up with 111 times more stored energy, the large shaded blue box on this slide. You now see the compelling attraction of hydrogen energy storage in the German energy market. It simply has the scale to do the job. And it's for this reason now we have the announcement of 18 energy storage projects in Germany as their levels of renewable penetration have well exceeded 20%. And in fact, in the northeast of the country is rivaling 30 and 50% of the generation energy coming from wind and solar today. There are alternatives to storage. One of the alternatives, as already mentioned today, is the notion of curtailment. In some jurisdictions, in, in Canada, for instance, this is not legally done. The utilities are compelled to take the energy and there's no payment for curtailment. However, the export of energy then becomes a very common methodology for shedding surpluses of renewable generation and we end up with negative pricing in our energy markets because of surpluses at certain times of the day. The curtailment of nuclear operations is also part of this problem because as more generation comes from renew renewables and the destabilization that arises from that, then there's a need to cur curtail nuclear generation baseload and that's a very difficult thing to do and typically takes upwards of 72 hours. So export has been the solution of not choice but necessity in recent years in areas like Denmark and Germany and parts of North America to deal with the surpluses that are uh, driven by renewable generation. And so converting the economic value of local renewable generation into a storable form is the most attractive way to complement high penetration renewable generation. And it's this story that drew the attention of E.ON and Enbridge into working with us for the deployment of power to gas solutions. Our energy world today you see is highly siloed. We have transport fuel representing about 36%, electricity about 20%, natural gas for heating and industrial purposes about 35%. And these three silos have very little to do with each other in our energy systems of today. By inter introducing hydrogen as an energy carrier, we have the ability to migrate energy through these various sectors and most importantly use the storage and distribution assets of the natural gas system as a way to carry away the surpluses of renewable generation from wind and solar. So we come down to the important business aspect of how do you make money in this particular application. Of course, I want to sell electrolyzers, but my customer must get value out of me doing that. And so there are, if I simplify the story, there are three critical areas, revenue streams that arise from this application. Starting at the bottom is grid stabilization. An electrolysis unit can respond in fractions of a second to fluctuations on, in power on the electrical grid. And so we're able to deal with stabilizing the grid. This is a revenue generating service that all utilities acquire today and typically has prices and markets established and can represent up to 25% of the economic value of this particular solution. Then we have the ability of supply and demand load leveling. As I mentioned, upwards of months of storage can be delivered through the use of the natural gas system as a storage container. And this is not out there. E.ON will be delivering hydrogen into the natural gas system in Germany after we commission our plant of two megawatts in Falkenhagen, Germany in December of this year. So the plant will start operation in January of next year. So what we're talking about here is not futuristic. It's something that's actually being done. And finally, the output of the, the energy content that has been stored can be put to many flexible uses, either for transportation fuel. I mentioned earlier we opened in February of this year the largest hydrogen fueling station in Europe, in, in, uh, in Hamburg, in Germany, run by an electrical utility. So crossing over these silos and making the connections between renewable generation storage and transportation is already happening. <clears throat> Now, there's a lot of data on this slide, and the slide actually exists on account of a visit that I made to some investors here in London about four weeks ago, challenging me about the, the economics and the, the details of how you put this together and actually see a rate of return. 
The only thing I draw your attention to this morning on you, you'll have this to take away as part of your package, but on the right-hand side, you can see that at least a utility rate of return, ROI, is realizable across four different business models in using this power-to-gas solution, whether it's for grid scale or biogas enhancement or the wind-gas cooperative model that uh, is being marketed today in Germany or finally a captive wind-to-hydrogen fueling model, which has already been talked about this morning. In each case, we're showing a positive 12-15% uh, uh, re return, and this has been basically the math that Eon and Enbridge did over a course of 14 months as they did, did due diligence both on the solution and our company in looking at business models for this application. I'm just going to move quickly now to some of the other areas of opportunity for our company. This is the, the product that we've generated for using hydrogen uh, as an energy storage device in conjunction with cellular tower site, sites. Uh, many areas around the world are now looking to fuel cells as the way to provide extended run backup power. Uh, one example is Norway, for example, where uh, upwards of 72 hours is now required as part of their communications network. Historically, this was an application done at about two hours of storage using batteries, and the request here is for a thousand sites uh, to be uh, su supported with uh, hydrogen fuel cell backup power. This is a new and emerging market that's clearly showing itself. And so when we put that in the context of our growth story as a company, on the left-hand side of the slide, you see the base of, of foundation building that we've done where about 80% of our revenue is coming from the industrial gen of, generation of hydrogen using electrolysis, about 20% in the blue portion from the uh, hydrogen power systems and fuel cells. Uh, the period that we're in now, we're seeing a substantial scaling of our revenue. This is already reflected in the backlog and, and more will come where we'll double the revenue of the company and move into a period of profitability. Uh, that incremental revenue will come from the scaling of our power systems applications and energy storage projects, which are already showing themselves. And then ultimately, we expect at least a third of the business will be covered by each of these three applications. <laughs> Some of this is already reflected in the ownership of the company, with more than 50% of the company owned by strategic investors with a focus on the applications that I've been talking about, Comscope on cell tower backup and Bridge on energy storage. General Motors was an original investor in the company uh, when we went public in 2000. We have a number of distinguished partners in doing this business. It's not easy to win business with these parties, and we've been able to see recurring revenue from many of them. So just very quickly, from a financial point of view, um, I feel accountability having joined the company in December of 2006 to go back to that time, uh, a time when we were losing more than $35 million a year, had negative 13% margins. Through the time of the Great Cliff in 2008, we were doing very well with substantial revenue growth and margin improvement, more than a 50% improvement in, in our margins. Uh, we lost half our revenue, like many companies, at the time of the recession. Uh, this year, we'll be back up in the vicinity of the 2008 level, so a full recovery. And you can see, notwithstanding the fall off in revenue, we've been able to maintain positive and attractive margins, although my target is more in the range of 30%. This is the breakdown of our order backlog. You can see going back to Q3 of last year, a substantial jump, and we're looking forward to ongoing growth through the rest of this year and into next. Uh, current backlog at 27 million. Uh, this is our EBITDA loss pattern. Of course, my number one target is to bring this company to profitability. And today I have great confidence that that is going to happen in the near term. Our uh, revenue results, I'll leave this for your study uh, in the package as you uh, look at it at the end of the conference. Quickly, a summary. Uh, this market is clearly on the move again. For those who are interested in taking stories that have kind of fallen by the wayside and fallen out of favor, I think now is the time to look very carefully at the fuel cell market. And as I said earlier, I'm happy to come and account for that statement uh, next year. We hold a number of important cards in a number of application sectors where we see very tangible promise of this reemergence. The important thing now is for companies to be able to execute. In my history, I used to make a thousand cars a day, every day. And so when we're working with these kind of utilities, the level of reliability, quality, and performance and, and production output that's expected is something that our company is made to actually deliver. The link between energy storage, renewable generation, and transportation is showing itself with actual customers spending real money. Uh, this is not out there. This is happening today. 
And so that success is already showing up in the backlog of our company with confirmed orders. So if you're interested in this kind of investment, uh, nascent emergent opportunities that have gone through the hype cycle and now are showing themselves once again, I think now is a good time to buy. Just don't let the old dynamics put you off. Thank you. Thank you.